Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Seilstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. I want to mention to you that the handout for our sermon today can be found on the www.centerpoints.org website services page or on our YouTube channel and on my Facebook page. Now, today we're continuing with the second message in my Christmas story series, and it's called Reflecting on the Greatest Father Ever. Now, please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, so we can have this passage ready as we walk through it. Now, let's begin by looking at the world's greatest fathers. Now, when I think of who the greatest father in the whole world is, I would have to say any father who loves his children more than themselves. And I can tell you that that doesn't always happen in life. When asking a child who the world's greatest dad is, many will reply, my dad. But sadly, some don't. Now, by the way, I'm not leaving moms out of this message I'm talking about, though, about fathers in particular, because I'm talking about Joseph today. But a father who accepts their child and loves them so much is really a great father. I mean, a father who adopts children as their own is equal to, or in some cases, greater than a natural father. I can tell you from experience that I know that for a fact for many reasons. One of the girls I went to high school with talks about her parents and her adoption. When she posts pictures of, of her father, she explains that she loves her dad so much because he chose to be her dad. I mean, to me, that, that tells you that's real love. I mean, that is so awesome. If you want to talk about the love that some fathers have, let, let me bring up an important one, God. John 3.16 tells us that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. I mean, God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to come into this world, to later die for our sins, and then raise again to bring us into eternal life. I love that. What love a father like that has, that he gave his only son, that the whole world could come to know him. I mean, Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. God sent his most precious child, his son, so that he could legally adopt us as his children. When he sent his son, he had to make sure everything was in proper order. I mean, most of us are familiar with Mary. You know, that's Jesus' earthly mother. But to be legal and upright, Jesus needed an earthly father. And God chose Joseph to fit that profile. I believe that Joseph fits the profile of being the world's greatest dad. I remember hearing about a family that had a large nativity scene in their living room. And many, you know, think about this. Many people, they see a nativity scene and they just look at it and they, they focus on Jesus in the manger and maybe the wise men or something. But here in this manger scene, there's Mary, there's an angel, shepherds, animals, and the wise men. They were all there. After about three years, the dad finally notices and he asks, hey, hey, where's Joseph? And the mom said, oh, I bought the nativity at a garage sale for $9, probably because he was missing. But I didn't think anyone would really notice. And see, I was right. It took you three years to notice that Joseph was gone. So see, Joseph is so easy to overlook in a Christmas story. Yet he's likely the one person in the nativity that I can really identify with. I mean, Matthew and Luke both trace Joseph's family back to David's royal tr family tree. I mean, prophecy required that the Son of God also be the Son of David. Now, both Mary and Joseph, they were of the lineage of David. Joseph and Mary were both biologically descended from King David. Jesus was biologically descended from David and legally descended. Think about this. Through Joseph, by accepting Jesus as his son and the husband of Mary, because biologically he was the son of Mary. And then legally he was the son of Joseph. But by Joseph adopting him, he takes on the, the aspects of an adopted son. Basically, he took him in as his son. There was no real, I'm sure, formal papers filled out or anything like that, but they, he accepted him as son. So legally then, Jesus became under the lineage of David as well. See, we really need to reflect on Joseph's faith 
this Christmas. We really need to understand how he took care of all of these things that took place that we don't really talk about or see that was behind the scenes, but he's a very important individual because Jesus being raised without a father would have been a real problem. And especially in that time, and it would have been a problem for both Mary and for Jesus. But today, I, I will tell you, this world's greatest father named Joseph, he's worthy of a deeper look at. And I really believe we need to look at him so much deeper than we have in the past. But you see, by faith, Joseph displayed kindness under pressure. Matthew 1, 18 and 19 says, Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. See, kindness and godliness go together. Not only do righteous people show kindness to other people, but in fact, Proverbs 12.10 tells us that the righteous even show regard for their animals. Our culture suffers from a shortage of kindness. Hateful comments are written every day on social media. And, I, and sadly, it even shows that even believers tear down fellow believers. Joseph's example of kindness can teach us a lot about faith in the midst of disappointment. From a human viewpoint, Joseph had every right to be angry. His fiance unexpectedly left town for about three months and returns home three months pregnant. Very strange. Her, her story about an angel's visit and still being a virgin but pregnant must have sent him reeling or at least deeply concerned about the validity of what she was saying. How could he have been so deceived about Mary's character, thinking to himself? And why would she make up such a story about an angel's visit to cover her betrayal? Some people say that the stigma of an illegitimacy followed Jesus throughout his life, using John 8, 41 as an example. But most scholars don't view it that way, as there is no indication in Scripture backing up that kind of idea. The use of the word fornication in John 8, 41 is identifying idolatry. And the Jews here are saying that they never committed spiritual adultery, but staying true to God. But I will, I will say this. In our morally lax society, we can't fully understand the shame that this label would have brought to her in Joseph and Mary's culture. And so therefore, it, it never really shows anywhere in the Bible that he lived under that stigma. See, books that have been written less than a century ago provide an idea of the stigma and consequences that a moral lapse brought. And a compromising letter was enough to ostracize a woman from polite society and prevent a respectable marriage. See, under Mosaic law, anyone guilty of adultery would be stoned. Leviticus 20.10 says, If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. See, in the steps of a Jewish marriage, there's a binding commitment of a betrothal. First, there's the engagement. A contract is arranged by the family members. Next, the betrothal takes place. It's a public ratification of the engagement. During this period, the couple is considered husband and wife, though the marriage has not been consummated. So they don't stay together. They're not with each other. They don't have a relations with each other. It's a time and a place for when the marriage will take place. The actual ceremony or the, the thing that they do together, and then they have their, um, their time together. And so the only way a betrothal could be terminated was by death or divorce. See, the last stage is the marriage proper. That's when the groom takes his bride into the bridal chamber and consummates the marriage. This is followed by a wedding party. Now, there had never been a virgin birth before, ever in the world. And especially in Israel, they had never heard of such a thing. Now, it was prophesied about, but it was natural for Joseph to doubt Mary's explanation. Yet Joseph's faith guided him to be kind, even when his emotions were within him. I'm sure that he was quite upset. He chose to quietly divorce her and protect her from public shame. Joseph models a Christ-like response to betrayal. 
kindness, and grace. Leave the door open for the wrongdoer to repent and be restored to God and his people. In Joseph's case, when Mary's reputation was cleared, he had to deal with not only having doubted her story, but then he would also have to deal with the fact that she was pregnant. What happened there? But he had no regrets about how he handled the matter, how he was going to take care about this, this whole thing. But Joseph's kindness with Mary, when he believed she'd betrayed him, showed the kindness and the faith that produces even under pressure. Galatians 5.22 shows us that the kindness is listed as a fruit of the Spirit. So next, here's what happens. By faith, Joseph showed his courage. Matthew 1.20 says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Why was Joseph afraid? Well, the obvious answer is that he feared Mary was involved or had been with another man, that she was immoral and not the person he had believed her to be. Since he hadn't heard from God at this time, how could he believe Mary? How could he ever trust her? How could he raise another man's child? The angel quieted this fear. And, and I'll tell you, there was no other man. Mary had told him the truth. She was carrying the Son of God, just as she had said. And I imagine other fears also that had taunted David. But when the angel came to him, it quieted that fear. Mary was three months pregnant at this point, and to take her as a wife made him look immoral. Why would this do this? Why would he do this to his standing in the Jewish community? Would his carpentry business suffer? Would they be thrown out of the synagogue and shunned by a family and friends? But when Joseph heard that this was God's plan for him, all other concerns melted. He put aside his fears and he followed God in faith. Joseph didn't deny the challenges involved, but he accepted God's plan with courageous faith. When we know and trust God, we can also find the courage to face other fears and to follow him. I mean, I don't think I can under, overstate what a huge step of faith this was for Joseph to believe Mary or the angel of God in his dream. I've had dreams that seem so real that it took me a while to get my bearings when I woke up. How could Joseph verify whether this baby was a result of Mary's indiscretion or God's intervention? Joseph displayed great courage by trusting his heavenly father instead of his own feelings. I mean, look at Zechariah. Zechariah had an angel stand before him and tell him that he was going to have a son, and he didn't believe him. He wanted a sign. Here Joseph has a dream, and the angel tells him what's taking place, and Joseph believes. I mean, that is courage. He accepted his leadership role as a husband and father bravely. So should we when God gives us something that we need to do or face. If our family has problems, perhaps we should pray over them instead of panicking or getting upset over them. Trusting God with imperfect people in our families and ministries takes courageous faith. Okay, then by faith, Joseph received guidance and revelation. Look at these two scripture passages found in Matthew 121 and Matthew 20, or excuse me, Matthew 2, 13. Matthew 121 and Matthew 2, 13. They tell how Joseph received guidance and revelation from God on what to do in certain circumstances. Matthew 121 says, She will bear a son, and you shall name, call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He received some direction here. Now, Matthew 2.13 says, Now, when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. See, sometimes when we feel anxiety because we're not sure about what steps that we should take next, well, when that happens to me, I remember how God dealt with Joseph, and that reassures me. God even talks to him in a dream and says, this is what you need to do. You know, there's times in my life I'm trying to figure out what to do. I don't know how to handle something or I have a question. And I'll go to sleep, 
And sometimes the Lord speaks to me in a dream or he'll wake me up and tell me something. But you know, in the morning, I feel so much better because I have the answer. And see, throughout this story, God warned and directed Joseph step by step. And what's incredible is that he listened to God. In John 16, 13, the Bible says God shares insights with those who walk with him. It also says in Proverbs 16, 9, that God directs our paths. God's ways can sometimes baffle us. I know it baffles me sometimes. If I've been dealing with the events of the first Christmas, I might have preempted the tension and misunderstanding between Mary and Joseph. I mean, I was thinking that it would have been less stressful to send the angel to Joseph first before he met with Mary. Maybe even warning Joseph before he went to bed that he needed to get up and flee in the middle of the night so he wouldn't feel so rushed and he could have been prepared. We don't always know what to do, but God does. We don't always know why God does the things that he does, but God knows. We don't know how we'll accomplish something, but God does. We may or may not come up with a plan, but God's plans are so much better than ours are. Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But God's ways are not my ways, they're better. So in his timing, God sent Joseph the direction he needed when he needed it, not before. He'll do the same for us. I mean, next we need to see, by faith, Joseph obeyed God. Matthew 1.24 says, When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. Joseph demonstrates the obedience of faith. He married her, but did not have physical relations with her until she gave birth to Jesus. Compliance to God's word is the result of blending convictions and compassion and courage together. Joseph took a pregnant Mary almost 100 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Then from Bethlehem to Egypt, that's like six, 760 miles with their newborn baby, just because an angel told him because God told him what to do. Eventually, he'd backtrack at least 900 miles from Egypt to Nazareth, having taken the long way around to avoid trouble in Jerusalem. Joseph wasn't chosen because he was the smartest man, or a rich man, or a famous man. Joseph was chosen to be the best earthly father because he was God's obedient man. Think of that. It just it brings me to tears. He, as I said, he was chosen to be the best earthly father because he was God's obedient man. He obeyed God. Three times when an angel spoke to him in a dream, he immediately obeyed. Matthew 2.14 says, So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. A person of lesser faith might have waited to finish the carpentry project he was working on or, or to, so he could get paid and he could have some extra traveling money. But Joseph's obedience showed his trust in God's wisdom and provision for the unknown. And then we see that, that by faith, Joseph lived within his means. I mean, I'm convinced that Joseph cared for Mary very deeply. So what happened? They ended up in a stable. Yet on that night so long ago, there was not much that he was able to do. He, he, there was, he was unable to give her what she would like to have or what he would like to give her. I mean, think about it. The smells and the lack of a clean bed and sheets among with them because they're in a stable. I mean, have you ever spent time in a barn? I mean, I know a little bit about those circumstances they faced that night when the baby Jesus was born. I mean, being in a barn is not the most pleasant thing at times. I mean, they had, to, they had to stick around, think of this, because she wasn't in any shape to travel. And according to Mosaic law, a baby boy is circumcised eight days after birth. So after having a baby, she probably wasn't, especially being in a barn, a stable, she wasn't really uh, able to travel much. So where she stayed during this time, we don't know. But eight days after he was born, he had to be circumcised. Then when the mother's purification time frame is completed, 40 days after giving the birth of a son, it'd be 80 days of giving a birth to a daughter, the mother had to present an offering. 
And the law stated that, that what, what was necessary for that offering. Leviticus 12, 8 says, If she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Well, Luke 2, 24 says, And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of, two, of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So we can tell by this that, that what happened here was Joseph was a poor man. He couldn't afford a lamb to give his wife Mary for the offering that needed to be given for the purification. At the presentation of Jesus at the temple, remember, this is God's very own son and Joseph's adopted son. Mary and Joseph didn't offer a lamb, but the lesser offering of a pair of doves or, or pigeons. You know, that gives us you know, a, an understanding of something. They gave their offering to God from their poverty. I appreciate that, uh, that the Christmas story shows the humility of Joseph. He did the best that he could do, and that's what's important. And I will tell you, by faith, Joseph was a man of compassion. Nothing bothers me more than to see a husband make fun of or humiliate or disrespect his wife. It makes me angry. And it bothers me even more to see it done in front of other people. God chose Joseph because of his compassion. Joseph was going to handle the whole sensitive situation in a compassionate way by preparing to divorce Mary privately instead of humiliating her publicly. But God had other plans for him. Being righteous means doing the right thing in the right way. This is the kind of great father God chose to raise his only son. It's also the kind of father God chose each of us when we raise our kids. God's fathers and husbands don't, they don't, it really, they don't really do these things that, that some of the people in the world do. They don't intimidate. They don't humiliate those that God has called them to love and to lead. Joseph knew how to treat people, and quite frankly, so should we as Christians. Deuteronomy 22, 21 gave Joseph the legal right to have Mary stoned, though that was rare now, here, or even in the first century, it could happen. They stoned Stephen, and they could have done that to Mary. But in our society, people don't stone people these days. Instead, they sue them or bully them on social media. I can tell you a whole lot about a husband or a wife by how they treat their spouse, their kids, their parents, employees, others online, servers in restaurants, janitors, or even flight attendants on an airplane. I remember one time when I was traveling back from Los Angeles after taking and moving my daughter down uh, for college, and I was with some other people with, with my son-in-law's parents, and, and we were all at, at this restaurant. And we were sitting there having some, some lunch before traveling further. And all of a sudden I look over and I'm listening to this lady belittle her father. He, he looked like he was in his 90s, which she confirmed a little later um, <laughs> in an interesting way. But she was just tearing him down. She got mad because he got lost on his way back from the restroom and they had to have someone help him get there. And then she was accusing the lady that was helping him get there of trying to get money from them for doing this. And then she started going on and on. She kept belittling him. And I finally had enough. And I don't normally do this, but I had had enough. And I went up and I just told her off. I said, how dare you disrespect your parents? And your, your father like this, why would you do that? And I mean, she was like trying to make excuses. I says, no, there is no excuse for disrespecting that. And I'll tell you, when I see that happen with a husband or a wife doing that to people, it makes me upset. It is wrong. It is ungodly. And we should never humiliate or treat anyone lower than us. Now, I tell you, in that situation, I had to repent, but I was not, I was not happy. And we have to understand that Joseph did not want to do that kind of thing to his wife, to Mary, the woman that he loved. And, and you know, here's the thing. We can't humiliate or treat anyone lower than us. Why? Because none of us are better than anyone else. Plus, God expects us to be compassionate towards one another. So when we think about Joseph, we should think about him as being the world's greatest father. He took on the adoption of his son, Jesus, as his very own. To love and to care for him, to teach him the skill of carpentry, 
and to raise him in a godly home. Adoption brings us the rights of being heirs of the Father. Galatians 4, 6-7, And because you are sons, it says, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. And the adoption we have in God's family, into God's family, becoming children, it gives us the rights and privileges of being God's children, of his children. Joseph tells us his story through his actions. It shows his love for God and the love he had for Mary. And it shows his love to take on the responsibility of being the earthly father of Jesus, the Son of God. It reveals the greatest love story of all, the story of Christmas. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that today we can see your hand move in our lives. We can see what you desire for us through your word. We thank you that you have given us an example, someone that's not mentioned much in the word, but he, it's mentioning your earthly father, Joseph. And we thank you that he showed such an example of the love that you have for him and the love that God placed in his heart that he might do the right thing. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we give you all the glory. Thank you for giving us the greatest gift in the world. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining in with me today for this message. And next week, I'll be continuing in my Christmas sermon series. And after this message today, I'll also be teaching in our, our Center Points class. So please look for it online as well. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day. Oh, and Merry Christmas. <laughs>